Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to You've Championed Yourself, Who Are You? I'm Chris Ferguson, your host, and it's always been my dream to showcase ordinary people who have taken their dreams, their ideas, and turned it into their reality. As they reach beyond their personal struggles, pains, and traumas, so many people give up. They lose hope. There are those few who can walk through their obstacles and their challenges and not know where they're where it's going to take them, trusting themselves enough not to give up, do the follow through in personal life, their career, in the relationships. They've championed themselves. Today, I have Star with me, and it's Star Ultra. And she's an amazing individual. She has a message, and it's about life. And I love that the fact that she is so open and vulnerable and wants to, and is able to talk about it in such a way that it draws you in. It makes you want to reach out and say, hey, I want to know her more. I want to know her better. So let's introduce Star Ultra. Welcome. Hi. Um, if you ever see me on social media, it's Alice Star. So that's oh, oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Because it was like, all right. Yeah. Alice Star. Well, that's one of the things on Facebook, folks. Look her up, Alice Star. So yeah. we'll re we'll revisit that at the end. But um, as an individual growing up in a different time than we are now, different values, different traditions, different social norms. I like interviewing people that have been through those times when we didn't have choices, when we didn't have abilities to say anything or have a voice. Can you tell me about that time? So this, in the past couple of years, I really learned a lot about reframing what I learned and why I learned it. And my mom came from a tough situation and she was also in that generation where you were the, the things that were honored about you were being polite and um, holding, being in the right place. You know, you, you, you're, you're not too loud. You lose, use your please and thank yous. Um, and I was modeled that you didn't speak up loudly. That wasn't the valued um, proposition of that particular generation. And I'm starting to see once I had a daughter, I wanted to understand that better because it was time to learn about that. And I thought there was something really telling about the fact that I wanted to be an actress because I liked to speak. I've been a talker my whole life and I, the power for me is language and I process through speaking and I talk all the time. And so it was always, you talk too much. You talk too loud. You became a cheerleader. You learn to project. You you sing like you're too loud. It's always too loud. And that was a message. Um, and so I wanted to be an actress. And now I see that that's because I was afraid of, of saying my own words. I wanted to speak, but that wasn't my opinion was not what needed to be heard. Mm -hmm. And then I got frustrated trying to speak other people's language and, you know, do their play. I want, you know, so now I'm stepping in and saying, I have something to say and it's important and it needs to be said. And I'm not afraid to get up and say it. How did that change your life though? When she started speaking, did you ever have that conversation with your mom and saying it's I'm okay with me? I'm doing that through leading. So, um, you know, I've learned that there are people who can hear it and act. And I think the gift that my mom gave me that is a precious, precious gift is talking through your emotions. So she was always there to talk about what I was feeling and to help frame it and process it mm -hmm. and give me the language around it, which I've realized is really important. And that is a gift I can give to other people because... Right. And also they don't know all the languages that they speak. So I'm starting to realize that like you say like, oh, I never followed through on that college education. Oh, I gave up on that job. Oh, I did that job for a little while. Oh, I hated that job. And I say, yeah, but the value of that is it taught you another language that you can speak out into the world and that you can say something that that person can hear. And only you speak all that combination of languages. And my mom gave me the language of psychology and feelings and understanding and 
if you don't have the language to process those, you can't even internalize it. If you, if you can't name it, every time you name something, you can process it where you couldn't before you named and put that your finger on that with language. So um, she gave me that gift and that was something really powerful and I honor that about her. And so I think the gift I can give her is just leading by example. And then, you know, maybe she's not going to move at my pace okay. and I'm, I'm guiding people so that they can go at their own pace. But I think the, the leadership and um, example that I give is enough. So. Well, I, I, I believe in the, in the power of words because words, you know, there was that old saying sticks and stones can break your bones, but names can, will never hurt you. Well, as we all know, being called names hurts more than getting hit with a stick or getting punched in the face or punched in the arm or whatever, because those bruises go away. The names stay with you forever. And a lot of people nowadays in this cancel culture want to cancel other people's opinions instead of trying to understand them. And that's their choice. But at, at some point, somebody's, when you do that, somebody's going to come cancel you. And I think um, throughout my lifetime, I took the messages from outside and I made them be about me and I made that be about my worth. And I don't think it's the names, it's the names that, that come from the outside that begin it, but it's what you tell yourself and how you internalize that to then be a story that you tell yourself all the time. And that's, you know, so awful. Um, so that's one of the, the pieces that I think is more important is how you speak to yourself. You I know, agree. I, and I, I absolutely. Yes. You can't see what you're saying to yourself until someone else names it or helps you name it so that you can be clear about like, wait, that's a story I'm telling myself. Oh, that's not the truth. That's what I'm telling myself. And I think that a lot of times the people out there that have a different opinion um, if I, I've worked a lot politically and trying to get things accomplished in my town and I've had to figure out how to have those conversations. And I found that asking questions is the key because what you're doing is you're getting them to question themselves. And that is the biggest, you're giving them the language that makes the crack that they start to question their own belief system. And I think that's so powerful. I think it is too. I just was, um, the reason why I asked the question is because many people who have, are like my generation, I'm in my sixties and we didn't have a voice, didn't have a voice, didn't have a meaning, shut up, sit down, be quiet. Don't say anything. That was the absolute silent dinner. Silent dinner. The only person that had a voice was the matriarch in that particular situation. (laughs) So, so now we have these grandparents, they're coming up to being great grandparents of a lot of children now. And what they, they, the dichotomy of it all is that it seems to be repeating in many ways, but twisted in a little way. But the thing is, is with parenting, how are you parenting your children or parenting children in life that was different than yours? Because that's Um, huge in in, in, in changing that dichotomy. Right. So there's some similarities. I think my mom, we talked about our struggles. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. And that was another gift she gave me. That it's not hidden. We don't hide it. We talk about it. And so that is one important thing. I think it frames my children to go out in the world and realize everyone's struggling. Mm -hmm. And that's where we come from. So, yeah, he's being a jerk. Well, why? Because he's struggling. And maybe you can help him. Maybe you can't. Maybe he'll learn a better way. Maybe he won't. If he's not being helped at home, he might not. But that's his struggle. And don't hate him for it because we're all struggling in different ways. So we sit around at the dinner table and just kind of like, how are we all doing on our struggles? You know, I mean, we're pretty open about it. Um, And we can name them. Like we know what each person's struggle is. I mean, it's it's that that quick. We've talked about it enough. You know, we talk about everybody's struggles. Like when you talk about drug addiction or alcohol or sex. And people say like, Oh, what age do you start talking about that? I'm like, "Eh, always, we've always talked about it. I think it's important that like, there's no, 
it just, you know, I mean, I kind of feel that way about nudity too. I mean, my kids see my body and I'm okay with that because they know what a real body looks like. If you hide your body away, they don't know what reality is. If you don't tell them about your fears and your hopes and your dreams and your hurts, they don't know that it's okay to have them. So I think, I mean, I had to go through a divorce and be a single mom and, and have little ones and decide how I felt about struggling in front of them. And I just think it's authentic and it's important to enable them and to talk about it so that they know how to talk themselves through it and to model. I'm going to, I'm upset, but now I'm working through it. Watch me work through it. Watch me rise through it. This is work. It's not just some people can do it and some people can't. We all have to work at it. And here I'm showing you the work. I'm putting it right out there. So um, I think that was what she, she did model for me, but the self-talk which I'm still working on because, you know, I'll have that moment where I'll, I'm such an idiot. And then I see my kid do it and think, oh, mm -hmm. so I'm showing them also that work that I'm like, oops, I shouldn't have said that to myself. That was mean and nasty. And what I say to myself is more important than anything. So I'm modeling the work. It's not about being perfect. It's about showing what's behind the curtain and having them watch you work through it so that they know how that goes and that that exists on a daily basis, minute to minute, second to second, working through whatever's hurting. Um, so those are that I would change. And then I also think that there's a, it might be that last generation that looks at their children as an extension of them. And this is another gift that my mom gave me. So I think she was part of that and she really, you know, both my mother-in-law and my mother really care about what your hair looks like. It's like so important. It's like the litmus <laughs> test is like when they say like, your hair, 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 hair. And you're like, not about the hair. That's that's the indicator that, that, that that's there. Um, but my mom, um, what was I going to say about it? Like in my chill, oh, she... So when I was a baby, my grandfather lived across the country and my mom wanted to tell him about me. And she wrote him a letter where she wrote all about me. And I was so little, like, I don't know, you know, eight months or 10 months. I think I might have been walking. So maybe a year old. OK, a year is pretty. You can really see who they are. They have, you know, enough indicators. So she wrote about it. And it is me. It is me now. It is everything about me. And that was a gift because I've realized that, like, children are who they are and now having a blended family and taking care of five different children and watching them grow you are gifted a human who is already who they are and your job is to see them and then just to be there you're not supposed to protect them from the ills of the world because they they have to if they go out in the world protected and they get dumped into the world i was there and it was a shock and you don't want to have your kid have that shock um, and they get walked all over because they thought the world was perfect and it's not. Um, but I think you have to let them be who they are and they are who they are from the beginning and who they are is not an extension of you. You're just enabling them to be the most successful them that they can be. And I think a lot of parents start to get so wrapped up in that, what that means about them and their parenting instead of just being there to guide this human into their life. Um, that's a so, strong message. That's a very strong message. I think it's I didn't important. cut you off, but it, that's a strong message. And I wish more parents would. I get frustrated with the school system because I, I, you know, these are stories I tell all the time. And I just, there is no reason that we have to have an A in every subject. It should be that if you, if that's your thing, if you're a math kid, that's your letter grade. You go for your A. You go as far as you want with that. If you're a math kid and you're not great at writing, it should be pass fail. You get introduced to the concepts. You do as much as you need to be an educated human in this world who can speak some of that language with someone else who's more of a writer reader. At least you can identify with them. But why do we need to have A's and everything? It teaches you that life should be hard that you should struggle. It teaches you like, so go towards the struggle instead of towards the ease. It teaches you that. It teaches you that you, you're you crap right from the beginning because you can't get straight A's. We don't need to all be perfect at everything. 
we need to be able to speak each other's languages, but I just want to, I hate that message that like, you're not good enough right from the beginning. See, I've never seen it that way because, um, in my life, the only way to get out of my circumstances was to get good grades because that got me to graduate from high school. Cause I knew if I didn't have an education, I was going to be a, become the product of, of my, my social standards. But the thing is, is I've also worked in the school district um, at an alternative school. And these were kids that had one foot in the judicial system. And it was their last time just before they're adjudicated as an adult. And then the last foot in the education system where they've been so disruptive or been arrested for, you know, drugs, whatever. And we had 3000 students. And I tell parents every day, I, I know you love your children. I know you think they're they're most amazing people in town. But when they're not with you, you have no idea who they become because it's not what you always know. I arrested a girl for she was a 4.5 GPA student. Silly, selling marijuana out of her book bag. And she was one of my biggest drug dealers on the campus. And she had scaled through her sophomore, freshman, sophomore and junior year and got caught in her junior year. And that she was more upset that it messed. Well, she got expelled for dealing drugs on campus. And her parents says, oh, she doesn't do that. She's never done that. We don't do drugs in our house. We, you've got the wrong child. And she just sat there the whole time because this was the perception she gave her mom and her grades reflected that. So I see grades as something to aspire to and not to be perfect at. Because when I was in school, I was great at math. I was doing algebra one and two in middle school. When I went to high school in the ninth grade, they didn't have a position for me in a class. So they put me in a general math class. And I went to the instructor and I said, listen, give me your final test. I'll take it right now. And he thought I was being smart and disrespectful. And I said, no, look at the classes I've taken in middle school. I shouldn't be in a general math class after taking algebra one and algebra two in exactly. middle school. That's exactly my point. They but should let you I, fly where you needed to fly. But you, now you've got to remember this is back in the 70s. And my, I went to my guidance counselor and she knew I was an orphan. I was, I grew up in an orphanage and she says, well, get someone to come up here and talk an adult up here to speak to us about it. And I looked at her and I got really ghetto and I got really nasty. And I said, you know, I don't have an effing parent. You know, I don't have anybody to speak up for me. So F you. So I slammed her door as I walked out. But this was the kind of atmosphere. If you didn't have somebody to speak up for you. And in the 70s, the parents started being so busy, two incomes, separate lives, doing everything, trying just to survive. What do I do as a kid that has no voice? Well, I'm telling you, it hasn't changed as much as you would have hoped. Well, no, the thing is, is I, I absolutely agree with you. It has gotten worse. But the thing is, is that kids are getting away with so much in school. And I worked with what th these were all high school kids. I had 14. I brought I, I interrupted a prostitution ring of 14 year old girls who were HIV, HIV positive. And this was in the early 2000s. There was no cure. I had um, drugs. I had, um, gangs. I had everything that happened in a city happened on this school campus. And most people don't think that. And then you have teachers teaching their opinion and not the curriculum. So it's, there's many facets around here that has been going downhill and it's been going downhill since the seventies instead of meeting it. But the thing is, is after in that year, I hated math from that point on. I hated math. I hated math. Yeah. So the fact is, is one teacher can make a difference once connecting with one student. And I'm fortunate that in my 15 years at that high school, even though I was in charge of security as a security specialist for the school board police, I saw children that needed help. They were punting. They were trying to do what they could do in life and listening to their friends. And as we know, our friends don't know anything about life. They have no ex real true experiences. So well, I just, when I look at that, I see children that are really smart. So, you know, I look at my friend, um, I had a friend who was a drug addict and she had um, stolen people's identities. 
and I get, I had an open heart and I said, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to open my heart to you anyway. And she was brilliant and extremely capable. And I think she wasn't offered the opportunity to be brilliant. And so she found it herself. And sometimes when you find those opportunities, they're not safe opportunities. And I think no one gave her that self-worth that she was so smart and capable. And so she already had, you know, a self-esteem issue that maybe drove her to the drugs, but then she had to get the drugs and she needed it so badly. It pushed her to be brilliant. You can't steal people's identities unless you're really smart. There's a lot of hoops mm. that go through. I mean, she not, has- real, not, not anymore with modern technology. It isn't because I have a girl in prison that stole my identity. And she's doing 10 years and I'm, I, you need that lesson. But I was one of eight other people that she was doing this to. Well, this was also, she's older than me. And this was like maybe 10 over, you know, 15 years ago. And she probably got in trouble 20 years ago. So back then, you know, you had to be. Then it was very hard because there wasn't the computers you have today. No, she had to like intercept mail. And like, there was like, it was a whole thing. I mean, yeah. she was really smart and everything I did with her, it showed me how smart she was and how capable. And so I just think like you're handed these smart, capable little people and you have your own baggage and then you shut them down. So then they don't, and you model bad self-talk, then they can't embrace their self-love. And then you put them in a school system that doesn't let them fly in the areas, my son is really good at math and he's still waiting for the day that he gets to fly. I mean, he's like an engineering kind of kid and you don't get that differentiation until seventh grade. He's still waiting and he's still working on his writing that he's never gonna be a writer. It's like not his jam, he's a minimalist. Like we don't need to spend as much time on that. Let him fly. And I think when they're sitting around, they're bored, they feel bad about themselves, they have a brilliant mind and they go into business for themselves and it might not be the business that's you know legal <laughs> <laughs> well see here's the thing is and i've got to tell this to, to the audience they all know i i've been in law enforcement for over 40 years and the thing is is i've seen girls uh and boys and there's prisons filled with people who are brilliant individuals, but they don't choose to use their brilliance in a legal way. So the thing is, is then I ask, well, that's their choice. And when you make those kind of choices in life, I mean, even, and I use myself as the gauging, being put in into an orphanage at the eight year, at eight years old, bullied, almost murdered in there by two girls, get out of there. I have a college degree. I have two, three specialty certificates. And I ha- I'm one of 11 children, but I'm only the second one in my family to have a college degree. And it was about choices. We all had the same events. We all had the same terrible time. We all had, the, well, the six of us did because the other four, we didn't even know about. My dad had had another other family. And so the six of us, I'm there's two of us that have a college degree. And it's all been about choice. It's been hard. I put my well, kids through also, college. There's genetics. So whether you're predisposed to to being someone who's more apt to end up in an addictive situation. There's that, but there's also the delayed gratification. So like some people are better than that. And I think these kids are looking for a shortcut, just like adults are looking for a shortcut. They're get rich quick, you know, don't put in the effort because you can do it easier and faster illegally. Right. And it's so brother, there was a drug dealer. I'm telling you, it's about choices, whether you're brilliant and intellectually, you know, a 150 IQ, it's about choices. There's a doctor that created those sticks that they're using for the COVID-19 sticks. The guy did LSD on a regular basis, but he was a brilliant individual, but he didn't do it and get caught. That's the difference. So that's the key that I think to parenting is important is I read this, I didn't do this with my older boys, but um, I was a single mom and so it just happened automatically. And having a big family, we do things better automatically because I can't do, I can't be perfect for them. I can't make everything perfect for them. And so I'd be out like shoveling the driveway and like, you know, they'd be doing what they needed to do at one and three. 
And so when I met my husband and he came over and he's like, your three-year-old's on the counter. I said, well, how else is he going to get his brother a drink? Like, you know, they need to do this stuff. Right. <laughs> and so then, but I didn't have the language to know what I was doing. I couldn't have told someone else to do it because I didn't, I hadn't put my finger on it and, and named it. But then I read a book um, one time and they said, let your baby or your toddler struggle. They named it. That's all I needed was the words. And I did it with my six-year-old. I watched her struggle when she was a baby. And she is such a capable person. She can handle delayed gratification. She wants to own it and stand on her own two feet and do it the right way. That's harder. She wants to. And that was a gift that I gave her. And so, and then I also think, you know, the delayed gratification parenting, that's like the struggle. To, to say like, no, you're going to buy your own car and I'm going to support you in the steps to get there, but I'm not handing it to you. Mm -hmm. You have to work for it. You know, I mean, even she didn't want to go to camp because she's got anxiety stuff, which I've never witnessed until this time. So I'm learning a lot about that and how that goes, which is a lot about naming. You have to name it to face it. Yep. Um, and so she didn't want to go and she's come a long way, but she still was having, she was resting about it. So I said, okay, you know, the boys get paid. They don't get chores. No, I mean, they don't get allowances. Nobody gets handed mm -hmm. anything in this world. You work for it. And we're all a team mm -hmm. and everybody has to work. And if you want something really badly that we can't afford, then somebody else is going to have to make a sacrifice. So this is a team decision. And we got to, because we don't have unlimited resources. So we have to, it's about priorities and decisions and really knowing what you want. So you wait for it and you don't buy that until you've really decided that's what you want. Let's wait a week. Let's wait a month. Let's see. Let's do the investigating. Let's look at the reviews, right? So I bought her a Barbie and I said, Odin gets paid for when he mows the lawn. This is your payment. I need you to do your job and your job is going to camp. And this is your payment at the end of the week. And we're not opening that until you've earned it. And she said, what do I have to do to earn it? And she said to her friends, I can't cry or anything. I said, no, you can cry. I know it's hard. I'm here for your struggle. That's fine, girl. But you're not going to make me feel guilty for going to do my job because I got to do that. So I don't want any of this. I don't want you to put your foot down and say you're not going. And I don't want you to make me feel awful because that's your job. And every day she'd say, how many points did I earn? And I'm like, I didn't even, I'm not even, doing her. I don't know. So she wanted it and she loved it. And every day she looked at that Barbie through the plastic. And the one time she said, like, can we open it now? And I said, we have the receipt. So this is your choice. We can return it and not do this. Or you can wait it out. And she waited it out and she earned it. And she feels so good about that. That is the gift that gives them the push to want to do it the right way, to wait it out, to not take the easy way out, to not take the get rich quick scheme. It's about you know, and when we're talking about our struggles, they realize that you have to work and you have to look yourself in the in the eye. And I'm always saying to my kids, I can't be there for every decision. It's it's on you. I'm here if you want to talk it through. I'll help you think of a better way to say no without being a dork or you can blame it on me or we'll have a secret thing that you can text me an X and then I'll text you. You can't go because I'm a jerk and I'll take that. We'll talk right. through how to do it. But if you don't come to me and talk it through. I can't help you. And, and it's on you. That decision is yours to make. And at the end of the day, your life is yours and you look yourself in the mirror. So how can you do that? I think that, you know, and when I see teens in trouble, they haven't been talked to like that their whole life. They didn't have that language. They haven't been talked through and walked through these, these situations. So they're stuck in that decision without the language and the naming it and to talking it through and how to do that. And I watched this, um, this, I heard this thing on NPR one time that was about language and it was about sign language. Right. And they went to this remote village where they didn't have sign language and they were studying that to learn about language. And they've also talked to people who had strokes, who lost their language and what was the difference and how could they explain that? Mm -hmm. And they gave them this instance where it was like a video and a someone's told stole a toy and then they had to kind of interpret and they would use like pantomime basically right. and they didn't interpret the situation correctly about why the child stole the to stole the toy because they didn't have the language to process it but then once they gave them those signs and taught them more language for emotions and named all those emotions the people were able to more accurately understand that situation and interpret it 
Mm-hmm. And then they went back generations later and saw the difference between the third generation and the first mm-hmm. once they had had that language given to them. So that's why I think it's so, I think words are so important. I agree. I agree with everything you said. I did the same thing with my child. I didn't, I wasn't handed anything. Everything I have gotten, I worked extremely hard for. So I made sure I didn't buy my child a car. I didn't, you know, I mean, she was an only child. So, but I, you know, I was just like, no, you need to earn this. You need to earn this. And so I absolutely it's not making me happy. No, correct. You. And so the parents that have the kids home and they're doing the laundry and making all the food and they're not making them move out, they have they feel horrible about themselves. And when you push them out in the world, they have a nervous breakdown because it's too hard compared to what they've been living their whole lives. Well, what did they what were they taught? Let yeah. me there's a difference between enabling and empowering. And if you empower your child to understand that this is life, this isn't, I'm not trying to be mean or ugly or nasty. This is life. And I don't want you to be a victim in life because so many people get stuck in victimhood. And this is something I teach all of my clients. You can either be in victimhood or you can become that oppressor like you felt was done to you, or you can climb that pyramid and become your own hero. And that is just the example that I've used in my life because I could, my brother was, one of my brothers was a drug dealer. He, you know what? He chose that. It made him fast cash. It was self-gratification. It got him stoned. He didn't have to think about his aware, what was going on around him. And he was 6'6 and weighed 248 pounds. Who was going to mess with him? So the fact was, is that, you know, it is, in my mind, I think I use a different word and that word is choices because when you teach these kids choices, they, in, and from the school that I came to, there was a kid that is a national football player. He just, Kansas City Chiefs, when he got a Super Bowl ring, there's a key kid that's on the Major League Baseball League. It's helping them figure out that by doing the steps and doing the discipline and doing the practice, that's what the education system is supposed to be about to help you become your best version of you. But it's also to educate. But I don't think it's a teacher's responsibilities to educate their children alone. Because I worked really hard to help educate my daughter. Thankfully, her father is as good in math as as, as she is and was a great source for her. When it came to English, I had it. When it came to social studies, histories, I had it. But the fact was, is that she wanted to be... Um, she came home and said, you all need to get different jobs. And I said, what do you mean? She says, nobody wants to be my friend because you're both cops. And I laughed and I said, well, that, that, that job is putting all this and that dress for prom on you today. So do we take it back? I said, the same thing is, do we take it back before prom? Because guess what? It's that money. Cause you know, if we don't have jobs, we don't have ways to pay the bills. And all of a sudden it stuck in her head. And so she got that thought out of her mind, you know, it was either prom dress or friends and prom dress won out, you know? So, but it was absolutely the same thing, but she literally asked us to quit our jobs because she was getting pressure from other kids at school. We can't be your friends because your parents are cops and you're going to go home and tell them what we do. And I I said, I guess that I think the way, you know, just to expand how you think about it. I think that choices comes with a judgment. And I think we've all made choices that didn't work out well. And sometimes when you identify with that and let that be your story, you get stuck. And I think, you know, your brother, because he was a big guy, maybe he didn't have to learn the language. He didn't need it. And so he missed out on that. And maybe there was an opportunity for you to have to learn more of it and figure it out better because you didn't have that to stand behind. And I just, I would, I I think there's so much judgment that doesn't enable people to pull out. If you're an addict and you wrap your, your whole self in the judgment on you about every decision that came a second ago, you cannot rewrite your story to envision yourself like role playing and and self perception you have to see yourself as the worthy capable wonderful person already 
in order to pull yourself out. And so I think I just, I like to enable, I like to put um, an opportunity out there for the person to see themselves where they're going and to let go of the judgment of where they've been, because that's not their story anymore. And every second is an opportunity for one of those choices. And so it's not about the choice you made. It's about the choice you have coming. And here, I'm going to give you the language that enables you to be able to think it through. Because if you don't have the language, it's like a needle in a haystack, which way you're going, because you can't work it through. And that's what I want my kids to come to me for, is to work it through. I'm giving, you have the choice and every second's a new choice. So don't worry about the one you made a second ago because we're moving mm -hmm. on. We're done with that, we're moving on. It's a new you. And the new you is full of possibilities for wonderful choices. Mm -hmm. But let's stop and take a minute, which I feel like that's why I kind of think meditation, there's something to it. I mean, it's annoying. <laughs> I meditate every day, I'm just saying. But here's the thing is, your children have that opportunity. There's a whole bunch of kids out there that don't have that support at home. I and they're never going to learn that language until somebody. You don't. I'm, I'm telling you, in this day and age, there is more kids out there stuck on Wii's and TikTok and everything else than communicate with their parents. And their parents' is leverages, and this is after 21 years of a 41 career in law enforcement, dealing with kids in a school environment. And the kids will placate. The kids will manipulate. It's not about enabling. It is about now. It's like, I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. And nothing else will matter. Yeah. But when we all, want, we all want that. Sure we do. And, and, and those are the conversations you have. But there's a lot of kids out there that aren't getting that language. And I didn't get it. But the thing was, is... I am was thick-headed, I think is a good way to put it, in the fact that I was so angry at the world and everybody for my circumstances because I was eight years old. I had no choice. And then as the traumas and the pains happened, I just I was like, this is not me. I don't know why. I just know this is not who I'm supposed to be. This is not where I'm going. And I ran away from the orphanage. I lived on the streets. I was 14 years old. And so the fact is, is again, I didn't have a support system. I just used the guidance of if my parents went this way, I'd go left or right, knowing that that had to be a better decision because my dad was an alcoholic. He was Native American. And yes, I have predispositions. I have predispositions because my mom has autoimmune diseases. And so the thing, unfortunately, is I have all this stuff, but I wasn't going to let that stop me. And that's the difference. I did. I guess I had an innate built in language because I have, been, I have been working since I was eight years old and I literally just retired from my J-O-B to do my J-O-Y this. Right. In well, May. there's also, um, you know, yes, there's your, your innate understanding of language like some of us are better at language I came out being better at language my brother was like silent he is not a, he has a hard time even putting his thoughts into words he's a physical he does you know um so there is that innate language skill but I think that there's also um beyond just being good at at that there's being a good learner and some people can look at something. I can look at a second of something and know where what it's teaching me. And some people can't. Mm -hmm. And so I just think, you know, I watch these little babies and where they are. And I think some people have natural skills that enable them to be survivors. And it makes it easier. It doesn't mean not everybody can do it. But mm -hmm. I think that's where I let go of the judgment that like, it's not your fault that you had the deck stacked against you more than me, like in terms of even race, right? Mm -hmm. It's not your fault that the deck was stacked against you. I get that that deck was bigger for some people than other people. Mm -hmm. 
we can all learn the tools and some of us are slower at learning and some of us are faster at learning. And I'm a good researcher. Not everybody's a good researcher. Not everyone's a fast reader. I can get more information than someone else. So I'm lucky. And that enabled me to be able to do it. And I look at my circumstances and they're not as bad as everyone else's. So I think that was a gift that like I was given enough to understand, but given so little that I can have right. to work with. You know what I mean? You so relate to both, even though you didn't have, you had the language, but then you didn't have the ability to acquire or to do because of the speaking part and you had to work for it. So it was, it was a duality there when you really think about it. But I, I love this subject. Not, I just love yeah. it. Not having so much trauma, I'm able to talk about it because I'm not, I don't have to enter into what you are entering in. My trauma is in just enough to understand, but not so much that I'm like, I can't go there or I'll be sobbing. I'll, I'll go back into it. You know what I mean? I'll go have a drink or whatever. <laughs> so I'm lucky. Like, I think that that's a gift to say, like, I can speak your language, but I'll raise you one. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm very fortunate in my life. I mean, with everything I've been through and everything that's happened in my life, you know, a near death experience at four, a near death experience at four, 15, 14, 14, um, cancer, head on car collision, pulmonary embolisms, near death experience with that. I keep asking my creator, I don't have nine lives. What's the lesson? So every time this has been happening, it's like, man, I'm still here. What's the lesson? Hurry up and teach me because this is crazy. This is crazy. So I get it. But then I have never judged myself. I was ashamed at one point of my, my bat, my growing up because everybody was labeled back in that time. And you were one of those kids. So the fact was, is I was just like, oh, I don't care. I just didn't care. I didn't speak. And I people thought, <laughs> I can't about everything. Every message that came into my world, I internalized. You're so lucky that it just, <laughs> I, mean, I have one of those kids. It's like it rolls off. That's it. I mean, I, I don't have a choice. I mean, I had to constantly keep my staying in, in the moment, which helped me in the long run and staying present in my life because it could change that fast. It could change that fast. So the fact is, is that that's the way I've always been. And so that is what helped me. And then as I became a shamanic practitioner and an energy Ooh. healer, it was all those lessons that I learned from that time. So I just, I love this. I love this uh, conversation, but I wanted to talk to you how you're supporting someone with depression and anxiety, because I do the same thing, but I actually heal them of it. So I'm, I'm kind of curious what you do. So um, I do a lot of writing and a lot of people who handle depression and anxiety feel drawn to my writing. And I've tried because I want to write more. I say, like, what what is it that resonates with you? So I know who I'm talking to and what I'm trying to. Why? Why are you listening? And they said, because you I get to watch you think it through. I like to watch you think it through because my writing is very much like that. It's like stream of consciousness about it, but I'm a very logical person. So I draw you along on how the argument goes and I walk you through the logic. I think one of the most valuable things I ever had in my life was I was, I went to school for acting and we had, instead of math, we took syllogistic logic. So perfect. It gave me the language for what I already knew. And so that's my gift. And someone told me once that like, I'm an adventure guide. And I was like, I'm not an adventure guide. I'm not like skydiving or like, so like I'm, I'm pretty tame, right? But they're like, that's not what we mean. We mean you go out there and do it for someone who can't. And in this terms, it would be language and vulnerability and like mm -hmm. showing up and telling you everything about myself. I'm fine with that. And so I'm leading by example. And I think that's where I explained to you about like my mom. I am helping her by leading by example. And that's the only thing sometimes that you can do because you just like my kids, I can't make your decision for you. I can't live your life for you. And I am not you. So I have skills and capabilities that you don't have. And so I can't expect you to go at my pace because you have a whole your own deal, whatever your challenges are. But I think 
giving that gift of showing how it's done and talking you through the steps is the only thing I can do. But not everybody can, I can't help everybody with depression. I, I don't, because I'm not going to sit there and hang out in it. And sometimes that's all someone can handle. Mm -hmm. and so the only thing I can offer is look at how I'm doing it. Let me tell you what I'm thinking about. And maybe that will give you the language to do it for yourself. Right. But I also, it, I feel that when a person's willing to change or willing to be vulnerable enough to say, Hey, I've got a problem. That's where the healing starts. And that's when they reach out. So I'm sure that's why that you're that light in the forest with your writing because of where they are now willing to reach out and say, well, so I've got to do something because what I've been doing isn't working. And I think it's a joy. You know, I've always been kind of a joyful person. Um, and I think the joy comes through. Like I see her struggling, but then I see how joyful she is. So it's right. something they want. You know, they're like, that's worth it to me to maybe listen to what she has to say. I want the joy. I agree with that. I agree with that. But one of your other things that you mentioned was finding your person. And I love that. I love, love. I'm absolutely authentic to the core. I want to know what, how you think about this and, and what you do in helping to find somebody. Cause I'm actually writing a book on helping people find their inner champion. So the fact is, is I, I'm kind of curious what, what's your stance on that or what's your opinion or Finding the person as in, can you be more specific? What you, you wrote down finding your person. So I don't know if you mean becoming authentic with inside of you or finding your true, your true person inside. Getting okay. inside. So I guess it's both. So I just had this conversation with someone who has been a dating coach in the past and we were talking about it because I met my husband online <laughs> and, you know, in, in trying to understand where I went wrong in my first marriage and what, happen there um and trying to put language to it you know i gotta i everything i have to figure it out and like <laughs> spell it out and then i have to blast everybody what i learned so that they all have the language it's just this is what i do right so i realized that it i didn't know myself enough i mean i'd come out of the situation where um I was constantly mediating between my parents and I was being told to be quiet <laughs> and I just, I didn't even know who I was. Right. And then I just kind of went with whatever. And I also didn't listen to what people were saying to me. Like I, I didn't realize like <laughs> some of the bigger thing than what the words are, you know, and right. I didn't, do that. I didn't trust myself. I didn't think that I, you know, my intuition was, I wasn't listening to my own intuition. So there were a lot of problems that then the person I found, you know, I hadn't articulated to myself what was important yet. So I tell people, you know, even in that marriage when I was miserable enough and it was awful and I had a newborn and a toddler and I was just feeling horrible and I, I internalized it all. Um, I wrote a list of all the things that I wished that my husband was. And later, when I look back at that list, everything on that list is what my my now current husband is. I had to name it. And mm -hmm. I um, so in order to figure out who you are, you have to take the time and space, just like meditation. You have to allow yourself to stop and have the space. So these people that are in relationships and like, I think I'm breaking up with him, but we still live together. Well, I'm still talking with him because I feel like maybe I don't know. I'm like, you have to get away and have your own space and your own time to sit and figure it out and try things. You don't know until you do the wrong thing. So I want to tell all my kids, like, dating is doing the wrong thing. So you know what that is, right? I mean, some of these choices are. Sometimes when you make a bad choice, you wouldn't have known unless you made the bad choice. It's important. These are telling you things. And so it's important to take that time, just like meditation, where you just stop for a minute and you consciously take the time to figure out who you are and what you want. And I'm constantly telling my kids, you're jealous of them. Whoa, stop. Wait a minute. It's about you. Mm -hmm. And when they're tattling, whatever, I'm like, let's worry about ourselves. Let's sit down. What is it that you want? What would make you happy? Let's go get it. We will make it happen. Let's figure out how we're going to make it happen. You have to sit there and you have to figure out what's going to make me happy. And you have to try things until you know what that is. And then when I made an online dating profile, it was all right there. 
<laughs> and guess what? I found another language guy, right? So like we're both language people and we speak the language of emotion. Maybe some of us better than others. I'm just saying. But I uh, understand. I got it. But it's like I had to get clear and then I had to broadcast that out and, and not take anything else. This is what I want. This is who I am. And I can put words to it. And that's what, it, what I stand for. And this is what I want. And this is who you are. And this is what you stand for. Don't call me otherwise. So I think it is both. It's who I am and finding who's going to compliment me. But taking that time is important. Mm -hmm. Just like that's taking the time to make the decision. You stop. Yeah. You take the time. And you, that's a practice. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, I get my ex riles me up all the time like this. Triggers you, triggers you. <laughs> and now I say to women who are going through divorce, I say, don't let it take you 15 years to figure yeah. out, stop and take the time and mm -hmm. know what your tools are to cope. Don't let, just don't just react because then you're sick for 10, 15 years. In my, <laughs> well, in my, in my coaching, I actually talk about triggering, how it's actually something inside you that when they say it, you're triggering yourself because you haven't dealt with that energy. You haven't dealt with that emotion. You haven't dealt with that, whatever that is, it's allowing you to trigger. And a lot of people, when they say they're done, they're not done. And when they say that they're ready, they're not ready. And so the fact is, is they're just reacting and it's, and you're in a reaction mode. You don't have time enough to think. And that's where you start overthinking things and people get tornadoes above their heads. Because if you were to reach up to try to grab some of the junk out of that tornado, you couldn't grab anything because it's spinning so fast with the what could have should have. Leave the situation. Even if you're mm -hmm. just deciding about a relationship, you mm -hmm. need the space. You can't be a, in the waves all the time because then you are, you're just constantly reacting and you don't even have time and space to think. And so I feel like what meditation taught me and I don't even do it that much. I mean, now I've figured out how to be quicker, how to drop into that quicker and recognize it. As long as I name it, guess what? This is a meditation right now. Just that moment of the breeze or the sun hitting me, I'm like, oh, that's a meditation. So I named it. And then as soon as I name it, it has power, right? It does. All it did was teach me to delay slightly. It just like a teeny tiny pause, like a glitch in the yeah. CD where it skipped. That skip was just enough to give my brain time to say, Whoop, it's happening. Like this therapist once told me, mark the behavior with a child, take the emotion out, which I could not do at that time. I've learned better, <laughs> it's easier said than done. But now I see the value in it. Just you marking the behavior puts language and a marker in their brain. Mm -hmm. And then they are able to catch those and work with them. It's not about the punishment. It's about the marking. Mm -hmm. It's about cueing them so they can connect their thought to that action, that their brain to that moment. It's, it's the cue. It's like, no, that's a cue. It's not about yelling at them. It's about cueing them that as they reach for the hot stove, their brain makes a mental note that there was an alarm, alarm sound at that same time. Mm -hmm. And it just cues. So sometimes we have to do that for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Have that minute to be like no to ourselves so we can stop and like, oh wait, this is a moment I'm supposed to think through. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because that's exactly the word that I use is take the pause. And it is the pause. And if you just take it in a deep breath and hold it for five seconds and then exhale, you'll be like, okay, I'm not gonna do that. That's and not that's okay. Delayed gratification of parenting. I am forcing them to pause. Yes, we will talk about that later. I'm going to think about that. And sometimes I say to them, I don't know the answer. I need to think about it. That's okay. We're going to take time to think about it. I'll get back to you. Or you want to buy that? Okay, we're going to pause and you're going to do your research and you're going to come back to me. And we're going to talk about it. And then I'm not saying no. I'm saying we're pausing. The pause is important because we're going to work through it logically before mm -hmm. we make that decision. So you don't just say no and walk away from the kid at the hot stove. You say no to market and then we talk about it. This is why. And you give them the language of what hot really means. Because hot doesn't mean anything if you've never experienced it. If you, you know, if your kid's never been hit, they don't know what it feels like when they hit you. Mm -hmm. 
So then you have to give them language to understand that concept, to walk it through, pause and walk it through. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Um, Here you say religion is a non-secular way. What do you mean by that? Well, like I, I told you earlier today, when I think there's a, there's, I call it like the universe. I just, something, there's something out there. I don't know if, for me, I'm a people person. So I, I feel like it's the collective, right? Mm-hmm. But this morning I was shoving something into the box. Yes, this is going to happen this morning. I'm going to make it happen. And the, the universe is sending me the messages. And I, this is where um, I'm taking this course. And she says, like, we were taught that things should be hard. And I think that's just what I have a, the problem with the school system is like we're taught that we're supposed to struggle with the thing that's hardest for us instead of going towards the thing that's easiest for us. So I kept shoving it in the box until literally the skies are open and it's pouring rain as loud as it could possibly rain. Like you're not hearing me <laughs> push this later in your day. Why are you doing this? And it's poor. It's so loud. I can't even hear you on the phone. Oh. Pause. <laughs> I think that the universe is sending me a message that that I need to like take the easier way. This just needs to be rescheduled. Speak up for yourself. Mm-hmm. Say, you know what? That's not a horrible thing. I, I, you like me because I'm busy. You like me because my life is crazy and there's all this stuff going on. And I'm going to own that. This is a little too crazy right now. And then I'm telling you, as soon as I use my voice to tell you that I think we need to reschedule. The whole rain lightened up. <laughs> like, la, la, la. And I told you it was like torrential flood warnings. So yeah. loud. Like, hear me, woman. Hear me. <laughs> and I can say, no, I can do it. I can do it. I can make it happen. I can do this. I can get it. Yeah. That is, that is, that is, I have to verify what she's saying is absolutely true for my audience that's listening to this. And I was more concerned with her Wi-Fi going out because then it would break up the the sound and it would be like, well, we'll have to redo it over. So if we need to reschedule, that's okay. It was I, after I, you I, again, the phone and you had said the word sound that, that I, I heard the rain. And I was like, oh my God, we can't do this with pouring rain on my roof. Wait a minute. I hear you. Oh, wait. I hear the message coming loud and clear, but you know, sometimes you I need to get over the head. <laughs> I, I told my husband, he goes, he goes, aren't you doing your, doing your interview? And I said, uh, no, we've had to reschedule it because she was on a phone and it was raining so hard. She could hardly hear me. And he laughed. He goes, that's crazy. It only happens to you. And I was like, no, it's not my message. I said, but I'm flexible enough. I go with the flow. Let's just, you know, when it's right to do, it's right to do. We'll just go from there. And he started laughing. So my husband's an NLP practitioner and trainer. Uh, yeah. So it's like, okay. But That's I'm a scan- what, I, what does you mean by I'm a scanner? So I just learned about this. This is amazing. Um, if I can give anyone this gift. Oh my gosh. I wish I'd gotten this gift when I was little. This is a, another of my problems with the school system. <laughs> You're not, you have to be, a, you have to be the best at something. You're supposed to specialize. You you can't dabble. It's not okay. You have to pick your major. You have to, you know, pick your elective. You cannot dabble in this world. And I've always, even my husband, he's a very, he's a, he's an engineer. He's definitely that, he's a one track mind kind of guy. He just, he, you know, if the dish personality, very oh, detail oriented, he needs to, the dishwasher needs to be unloaded. It has to happen right then and there. And I'm like, wait, I'm getting out the door and I'm trying to get out the door with a million children. And I have five minutes to get out the door. Like that should have been the focus, but he just can't, you know? So I have to cue him and mark the behavior next time. It's five minutes till I'm leaving. You're going to not unload the dishwasher you're going to turn to me and help me and then you're going to unload the dishwasher and then the next time it's fine he just needed the the you know cue Mm. (laughs) mark Um, but so but my superpower i've realized is a superpower is all the things having my hands in all the pots and my whole life i've been you know i read really fast i research a lot i'm always talking to everybody i'm getting their stories i'm getting to the point i'm going as fast as i can so i can just get it all, get all the information. But 
But my husband's like, you've got to specialize. You can't do 20 jobs. You can't have millions of things and the fingers in the pots. I'm like, that's what drives me. And the more fingers I have in the pots, the more, the more I understand, the more connections I make, and the more I can be helpful. It's important to me. But I didn't understand that that was a superpower. And so I just, someone in this course I'm taking just turned me on to Barbara Sher, S-H-E-R. And she does this talk about, are you a scanner? And this person said to me, you're a scanner. Now, guess what she did? She named it. She gave me language that now I can tell that story to myself and I am golden. There's a value to my scanning. That is my superpower. And what I've started telling people is like that your lifetime of languages enable you to speak to certain people and to translate between different groups or different situations or different pain points. I can speak so many languages because I've been scanning my whole life and I can make connections that other people don't see because I've been scanning. There is a power to that person. It's not the specialist. It's a different value. And I now I that that's been named. <laughs> you know, if someone had said to me when I was little, oh, you're a scanner. That's power to that. I would have owned it from the minute I was little. But my mom didn't have that language. That generation was not a scanner generation. There's no value to that. Mm -hmm. You know, you were you were. Well, a I don't know that transcendental. Um, what is that? Transcendental um, uh, meditation started coming out in the seventies out in Berkeley and stuff like that. So it was starting, but it wasn't embraced. There was a judgment on that for sure. There was a huge judgment on that. Yes. <laughs> I, hear, I hear the judgments from my mom. Like, Oh, that was, they were like, you know, smelled like BO and <laughs> There was a lot of craziness. I'm glad I was still a young kid at that age because God knows what I'd be involved in. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Well, hopefully that word is a gift that I can give to people. But, you know, I, I like that because I've always been the observer. That is one of my gifts. I observe everything, the minor details. I can I'd rather sit and watch people's behaviors. Um, I'm a certified uh, criminal profiler. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And so I'm that observer. I want to know why the behavior, I want to understand why they make those decisions. I want to understand how come they got to that point that they want to do this. And so with that, it's just like, I'm the observer and I, because of being in law enforcement, I'm this, I'm a scanner too, because I'll scan a room. I'll always look for issues that, you know, not, nothing input, nothing. I look for what's out of place as an observer. So don't you think there would have been some value to when you were little, if someone saw you and said, oh, you're an observer. Do you know that that's a superpower and that you can focus that in your life on where you're going and what you study and what career? And I'm just gonna point you in that direction because you'll feel fulfilled because you're already good at that. And you should go towards that and study that more. And here's the courses you should take. I think you should take sociology, behavioral psychology. These are the things that you need to know to continue in a really successful world of observing. Well, as a kid, I, I yes, to answer your question is absolutely yes. But the thing is, is because I was in an orphanage, I was one of those kids that couldn't go to college because they didn't do what they do now. I'm so grateful that they are evolving in many ways because here in Tennessee, every kid that graduates from high school gets a two year high school, gets a two years of college for free. Wow. You, have to buy, you have to buy the books, but it's free college. And it doesn't matter if it's a Bowtech school or a four year college. And I would have loved it. I paid $40,000 cash because I w wanted to be educated. I wanted, I knew that I had to do more. And I said to my husband, I said, I wish I could have gotten my degree earlier in life, but there's a reasons why I didn't, because right. I would have loved to gone to law school. I would have loved to gone and fixed injustices because that's in my life. That's what it's all about. But the same fact is it's kids. And with kids, when you find yourself in a certain, certain parameters, it's get you can't even survive. You're living in the moment. And then as you become an adult, you try to get out of surviving and at least try to thrive. 
And so the fact is, is I'm eternally, eternally grateful that I have the life I have. I've worked very, very hard for it. And so this is why I champion people because I know what it's like not to be a champion. And I see that in you. And, and, and even now after talking with you, cause we had a brief conversation before and I says, Hey, let's talk. And I honor you for your abilities to taking the time to do this. I think there's more things they can do. I think they should allow healing, natural, holistic healing in hospitals to help help and complement patients that tr trust and believe that more than they do a knife. I, I absolutely honor the fact that when people get, are not given options, but it's not always not an absolute because there's so many things in life that could change your life and heal you. There's so many bit, there's been so many healers on this planet that have healed people. And it wasn't about religion. It was about helping people. And when and we I'm, the medical world, that's where I think, you know, it's, it's not always about giving someone the answer in language. Sometimes it's about helping them understand what questions they should ask. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of my whole world about where you meet people in the middle, where you, you know, if you don't know the questions to ask, you'll never get the right answers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another piece of putting words to things for people is, I, you know, they can't even I, I would I went to the hospital a lot with my sister in law who just passed of brain cancer. And, you know, her husband was there to hug and kiss her and her best friend was there to keep an eye on her and, and keep an eye on the meds and what was supposed to happen and be that person that records the information. And I was there to ask the questions because I process things faster in my mind, which means I'm a speed talker and I've always got the next thought. Sometimes, you know, that's that's very judged in this world. That's not a positive. But mm -hmm. guess what? It is. Because I can process what they're saying to me enough that I can get the questions. And sometimes people don't even have those questions, so they can't get the answers. So there's there's just there's so much value in giving people the language that they need. And and I think when you go into a medical situation, they are not encouraging you to ask questions. They are not, you know, I I, I get so frustrated when like the builder put the tub together and then there was no like thing shelf where you put your shampoo. And I'm like, why is there no shelf where you put, he didn't, you didn't tell me you wanted it. That's not my job. You're supposed <laughs> to tell me what questions I'm supposed to ask. And when I got married and had pictures taken and some of the pictures were missing, that's not my problem. I didn't know the questions asked. You're supposed to tell me what I'm supposed to ask. Yeah. So I think that the medical community, you know, I was just talking to someone about surgery even like they're like, they have this mentality like, oh, you get surgery. Let me tell you all about the surgery. Oh, you have childbirth. Let me tell you all about the childbirth. Here's the procedure, procedure, procedure. They don't tell you how hard it is to recover. They don't tell you what a newborn is like. And you don't know to ask the questions. So I think if anything, they should be soliciting from people what they don't know or telling you, you know, what did you immediately like? What did you wish you had known? No one came to me and said to me, what did we do wrong with your sister-in-law? How did we not support the people left behind? Because guess what? They cared for her, but she's gone and we're all still here. What could have made it easier for you going through this process of trying to help her and support her and feel good about the life that you gave her for the last two years before mm -hmm. she goes, what could we have done to help you be a better friend to her or a better lover to her or a better whatever? They didn't ask. And now they'll never know what we don't know. And they'll mm -hmm. never do better. <laughs> and, and well, no, and I get that. But the thing is, is I think a lot of <sighs> it's all, you said it with procedures. It's all scripted and nothing goes outside of that script. And the thing is, is when you have somebody with cancer, I mean, I was single. I had a two-year-old. I had uterine cancer. I had to lie to my daughter because I wasn't going to explain, try to get a two-year-old to understand and scare them that I may not come back. But I had that conversation with my ex-husband. 
and said, this is where I am. This They're going to notify you so that you can come get her. And that was the hardest thing I had to do. But I was the person living it and nobody else around me even thought about it. So I absolutely understand what you're talking about because when you go under the knife, you don't know if you're coming out. You just don't know. And they tell you that. So that's that first, that first thought in your head. We don't know if this is the cure. We don't know if this is going to be the final it. So I, I agree with you and I think we need to do more, but I think I know in some places they're open-minded enough to allow like Reiki healers into hospitals, Native American healers into hospitals. They, um, as far as ceremony and prayers and stuff like that. So we're getting there, but it's, it's still not enough in my opinion. I agree with you. And I, um, you know, when you get shut down, I think as a woman, and I think even more if you're a minority, but I see a lot of parallels with how females are shut down. And it makes me understand minority issues better because I, it's like an entry into that world a little, I can kind of see what's what. So when you're repetitively shut down and your whole life, you're told not to have a voice that your voice is not respected. So when you, when I went to the doctor and I had Lyme disease and um, I didn't know, I kind of knew what was wrong. I, I knew what was wrong, but I didn't have the medical backup to like trust that. And I also, but I'm a strong enough person. I, I reached enough of a point where I knew I had a voice, but still every doctor I went to that said, you have low blood pressure. Your weight is perfect. you you look perfectly healthy. You're just fine. Your labs are fine. They shut me down until you didn't want to tell them anymore. And you wanted to just hide in a hole and just give up. And I know so many people in that situation. And I had mm -hmm. one doctor who said to me, if you know it, it's true. And don't stop until you find someone who will listen. That was a gift. And he couldn't help me, but he empowered me. And I think just when you've been, it's the deck is stacked against you when you've been told to mm -hmm. shut up over yeah. and over and over. And then it gets to the point where you don't even trust yourself anymore. because you 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 believe it fine i don't have anything to say of any worth mm -hmm. and i think the medical community does that to people so yeah like they're open minded to the to the the resolution to something that has a name that says mm -hmm. cancer on it or says whatever it is they finally named autism so now they're finally open to that because it has a name mm -hmm. but if your illness doesn't have a name Mm -hmm. you're, you're or like, like fibromyalgia. I've had so many friends of mine end up getting it because it's an autoimmune disease. And most doctors says, oh, it's just in your head. Then I've had other doctors pouring out gabapentin by the boatload to help them just try to deal with it. 900, there's a, an individual I know that takes 900 milligrams of gabapentin a day for the pain. What is that doing to the rest of her body? What is that doing? Th those are those hard questions you need to ask. And honestly, you know? I feel like fibromyalgia is just their judgment. It's like, we're writing you off. You need a name to make you feel better. We're giving you a name, but it doesn't mean anything. So one time um, when I was trying to figure out my Lyme disease and I had all this neurological stuff because I don't have a spleen, so it hits me harder and it went straight to my brain. Um and my friend who's a doctor said, so when you go to the neurologist, I just want you to know they don't have answers. They can only rule things out. And it's like, that's what uh, fibromyalgia feels like to me. They're just like, well, we could rule things out, but we don't have an answer. So we're just labeling it neurology. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just okay. Like, just a whatever. I, yeah. I just want to stop coming back here and have something that you can, a story you can tell yourself and it's called fibromyalgia. Now you have something you can Google, Google and now you have sort of a role model to look at that. This is what this looks like. And this is what this is. And you can ride that story for as long as you want. I'm not sure that all those people belong in that story. They can have different things. It's just, they're just sick of talking about it and they don't want to look into it because there's no money in it really. And I would love to see what the numbers are about females versus males having fibromyalgia. I bet it's, I think it's extremely high with females. And I think it has to do with emotions and the nervous system is in I my think opinion. It has to do with their judgment. 
Well, that too. But the fact is, is if you're making, if, if nothing's going right in your life and, and you're trying to figure it all out and you get so stressed, you can have a stroke. They'll tell you that stress can kill you. It could cause you to have a heart problem. Why couldn't stress cause you to have fibromyalgia is my point. I just because. think that if it was a man coming to you, as a doctor, <laughs> they will look longer and harder. Well, and, and medicine will study that problem until there's a solution. But, you know, they're not going to keep going because there's money. They think there's money in the man problem and there's not money in the female problem. Where's where's the orgasm pill for females? There isn't one, but here's one better. I've always said that if a man had to get a mammogram to diagnose prostate cancer, they would solve cost prostate cancer that quick because yes, no yes. guy in the world is going to want to go through and get in their junk smashed. I'm just saying. I'm and not. What fibromyalgia is, I think. I think it's the problem that didn't get solved because it's, I think it's heavily female. And I think that's just where they put you when they don't want to figure out what's wrong with you. I agree. They're just, and it's heavily female because they just put females in that box because they're not motivated and they don't hear, they are also ingrained in it that they don't think that what you're saying is true because they've been taught to doubt females, that we don't know ourselves. And they don't, they have not been taught that the female language and way of speaking has value. So, you know, I'm, I come in the marketing world and I do a lot of marketing in the business world with men. And I'm realizing that like I'm in the wrong world because they don't want to have their heart held. Female business people want to have their heart held. They want the holistic version of business. They want to have the whole package. That's mm -hmm. where I need to live. So when a woman comes to a male doctor and they even female doctors, because female doctors are ingrained in this society too, the women speak in a heart language and that is cockamamie then they're like, you're crazy because the language you described to me wasn't symptom based. It was feelings based. It wasn't, you know, high blood pressure. It was how you're feeling. I just don't, I would love, I don't, I wonder how many men versus how many women say when they are at the doctor, I just don't feel right. Mm -hmm. I would believe that it's probably women that use that language. And that doesn't mean anything to the medical community that has not been taught the value of female language. I agree. But also I would, I would be interested to learn and I may research this after this interview. Um, how many men versus women are considered hypochondriacs? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So think of that one because they see the woman as the emotional one. Well, there's a lot of emotional men too, but are you just going to write them off? Or are you going to actually check into it? See, I have a different perspective about cancer. They have spent 40 years and $90 trillion on looking for treatment for cancer. I think the, the treatment was found a long, long time ago, but it wasn't, it was too easily to be monetized. And if they heal you of cancer, they can't make any money. So the fact is, is that, you know, when they come up and say, we've got these treatments for prostate cancer, we have this pre treatment for breast cancer, we've got treatments for this cancer, treatments for that. Why don't you have the healing for it? Why didn't, why didn't you come up with the antidote or, or the, the prescription to heal this in that amount of time, considering you can come up in seven months and create a vaccine for a COVID issue pandemic? So, so it. I would say, what do you think medical research and treatment procedures would look like if the payment was guaranteed, if it wasn't a capitalist society of this structure, if it wasn't about paying the salary and making the money and a business, if it wasn't a business and it was just a given, like some sort of, you know, you just, you just, the government just pays for it but then it would still be a money thing. But I think, you know, the way that it's structured, it has to have a profit. It has to pay the people. It has to generate income. It has to be a business. So I think you've set yourself up for, yeah, we're going to have to, we have to follow a business model. That's, that's the structure of the whole thing. If people were just gifted grants 
and it wasn't about business and everything was a grant and your and health insurance was paid for and regulated i wonder how things would change because you, i don't you, i don't know because then it would still the cost would be come down to the people because somebody has to pay the taxes for this to happen so whether it's a capitalist society i'm just saying that in my mind i think there is a cure out there they've just never put it out because it would be a matter of you they, we couldn't get all this treatment out of you, the chemo, the radiation, the surgeries, whatever, yada, yada, yada. So I'm thinking that whether it's capitalist or socialism, whatever the fact is, is, is that I'm socialism. I'm from an era that I, I grew up during wars. My dad went to Korea. He volunteered for two terms of Vietnam. My brothers were drafted because they graduated high school in 74 and 75 and they were drafted. They never got called because when they got called, it was at the ending of the Vietnam war. So I lived through a different era and I saw, but it wasn't until that I did an information act request real quick on Vietnam and found out that it was the French were in it with Vietnam first and the way we got into it is that the CIA shot a missile across a military U.S. military boat. And that's how we got involved in the Vietnam War. We lost over 250,000 soldiers, male and female, for a cause that we weren't involved with. They wanted the opium from the area. I believe so. It. So the fact is, I mean, it's just been released. Anybody can get this in the Information Act through the United States libraries. But the fact is, is that when you, this comes out, all of a sudden it's like, what do you mean? These people died uselessly for, for you to be drug dealers across the planet? What the world, you know, what, you know, what else are you hiding? So it's all this lack of trust, I think is what gets people all riled up. Mm -hmm. So, but Ultra Star, thank you so much for being here. I, I love it. We've gone over an hour. This is going to be an amazing thing. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you, what email address or what website would they go to to be able to make contact with you um, to follow up in anything? I think the easiest way would be lookinginthegloss.com. So that's okay. where I have my writing and it has contact information. And it's just interesting if you want to read more about how my logical brain works because people that seem to enjoy reading that. <laughs> well, it's, I, the thing is, is it's, it's just, it's enjoying to see an open mind and being able to understand things. I, there's so many close minded people out there. You just wonder and you're like, okay, I understand your opinion, but how did you come to that deduction? Isn't usually my question. How did you come to that understanding? So, but once again, if um, I highly recommend everybody, everybody, everybody get in touch with Ultra Star. And again, that website is lookinginthegloss.com. Yep. So with that, we'll bid you a farewell for now. And Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate getting to share my messages because I think I, I, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. Thank you so much. It takes a special kind of individual to dream their dreams, their thoughts and ideas into reality. Ultra Star has stepped past many fears, stayed the course and had the courage to follow through to the end. Ultra Star, you've championed yourself. Now we know who you've become. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas, your thoughts and dreams with us today.